There it is. We're officially crossing over into the 7 o'clock mark. I want to make sure that we use good use of our time here as it is short and it's limited the amount of time that we do have to spend together. And I try not to keep you too much after. People got things to do. I understand that. Uh, plus, I'm tired, so I'm trying to get home too. I don't know about you. Uh, so good to see you all here this, this, uh, this evening. It's great to be here with the Bible study. If you don't have a copy of the lesson, uh, you probably should by now. And if you need another one, let us know. Maybe you filled it all the way out and gave it to a friend and you want to redo it. You never know. Other than that, I've asked Solomon if he'll focus our minds in a word of prayer before we begin our study. talking about if you had been John the Baptist. We finished up just a few weeks ago talking about what if you had been the Virgin Mary. One of the things that we're discussing, and you might notice a common theme between uh, this, and even if you've gone into some of the other studies with some of the characters we'll get into, is many of the early saints, many of those folks who were around at the, the start of the first century church and those things, and even before the establishment of the church, some of them had a pretty hard go of it, didn't they? And without the, uh, we'll use the word in quotations, without the burden of doing the will of God, they would have otherwise been living a fairly comfortable life. Mary would have been doing fairly well for herself. Joseph was well employed. She was going to be married. She was going on to do those things. And uh, We know that John would have been from a good family and he would have been comfortable. But you see, there are times where the Lord has plans uh, for us. And we, as what I think is our privilege, we have the ability to say yay or nay to those things. Uh, what we'll see through this study and through others is that things haven't really changed all that much, have they? We still have the ability and we still have the privilege to say yay or nay. You see, that's the beautiful thing about the religion of Christianity, where it is different than some other religions in the world. You may not know this. And, Maybe you've heard of it. There are other religions in the world where they uh, gain their followers through compulsion. You will die by the sword if you refuse to believe and pledge your allegiance. Is that really any type of love or allegiance pledged when it's done out of compulsion or a person is forced into doing it? The Lord forces no one's hand. When God is looking for someone to faithfully follow Him and to execute those things He would have them to do and to be able to be found faithful one day, He's looking for that to be done voluntarily. And it should be something that as we go through this study, we realize it's something that should be taken very seriously, but also done cheerfully, even when things are good. And we should also be cheerful that we might be able to suffer in the name of the Lord when things are not going well, right? We have other folks we'll get into where Paul, for instance, talks about, I rejoice in my tribulation. I'm happy to suffer for the name of Christ. I'm happy to do so. Because no matter how much I suffer, it pales in comparison to how much he suffered for me. It should be my joy and my privilege to return the favor as much as I can. And so as we go throughout these studies and we talk about John the Baptist and we ask if you would have prepared the way for Jesus and maybe left a life of comfort to be able to help others, be able to find the truth, would you have preached repentance? We have that opportunity to do that today, don't we? Do we do that? We think about, in some ways, how we might have it more difficult because of the scenarios that we face, but in other ways, we also 
have it easier. So the things that we can see that have not changed is there will always be a challenge before you as a Christian to be faithful. Because as Coach once told me, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Being a Christian is not easy. It's not the scapegoat. It's not the easy way out that sometimes the world paints it as. Oh, that's just the coward's way out. You're just afraid of dying, so you make up your fables and your fairy tales to make yourself feel better. You know, or to, to make yourself feel better about doing bad. That's in no way the Christianity that I see in the New Testament. That's not the way that I see it when I think of and I look at what John the Baptist had to go through. So I think we got through Roman number two of them correct. So then we get into the next question. Would you have baptized? Do you think that that kind of sounds silly? Does that sound like a ridiculous question? Would you have baptized? How many Christians today do you think would say no? Would any of you have said no? No, I wouldn't baptize him. Yeah, I can't think of anything. Yeah. I can't think of one that would prohibit you. I can't think of an example where it's happened, but I also can't think of a way when I'm looking through. Yeah. There's, there's sometimes, I mean, that's a good question. I had the one post to me one time, too, somebody said, what if I just lived all by myself and I found the Bible off in the in the bushes somewhere and I read the thing and realized what I need to do could I baptize myself I said you know that's a good question good news good news for me is I don't deal in hypotheticals I've learned that rule a long time ago so if anybody ever asks you that I don't know I, don't know. I try not to deal in hypotheticals if you find yourself somewhere off in the middle of nowhere and it's in a bush I don't know <laughs> do whatever you think is best yeah yeah that's like I don't know what to tell you but uh, maybe Keith has the answer for us yeah, how can you do that? Be bad, huh? You can't reasonably confess in front of people, right? Isn't it? He said if a person wasn't able to confess in front of people, then uh, maybe they're not ready to take that next step. You haven't completed the, the first one. Or maybe the third one. That's, uh, and those are, those are things I guess you could, you could get caught up in a whole other study that don't really have a whole lot to do with this one. But uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to study on it further if a woman... I don't see anything that prohibits a woman from being able to baptize her. I do know where there are passages I could go to that would prohibit a woman from going on to continue to teach that man. Uh, after, for instance, she baptized a man and the man has obeyed the gospel, uh, I can find some passages that might prohibit her from being a teacher, for instance, you know, in a service or a Bible study or other things like that uh, of men that would have already obeyed the gospel. As far as baptizing them, I can't think of anything that prohibits you from doing so. Somebody, I mean... Uh, I'm not saying I've read every single scripture, but I think I have. And I don't I can't think of one off the top of my head that would say no. And he probably knows more of them than I do. But he's shaking his head. So I can't think of one. The, the, the only passage that I can think of that would even remotely speak to the situation, mainly just in terms of kind of forming our thinking about it, is, and I would I need to find the chapter for this. Uh, there was an occasion. Uh, where the Passover was kept in Israel out of turn because they had not been keeping it, uh, determined that they needed to repent. It wasn't the, the time of year for Passover, but they kept it nonetheless. Uh, but before they did that, if I remember correctly, they consulted one of the prophets and ran their plan by the Lord first. Uh, and the, the only way that I would see it speaking to anything we're talking about like the desert island thing, 
Yeah. If you find yourself in a situation where you think, all right, you know, the, maybe ideally I would want to be in front of other people. Right? I, would, I, I would want to have another person at least present to baptize me. Uh, the, uh, the example of that Passover suggests that in whatever circumstance you're in, you do the best that you possibly can. Uh, now, we don't do what some people do and take those and kind of run with them and make, make laws out of exceptions, right? Make norms out of extraordinary circumstances. Uh, that's, that's the only thing I can think of that you can remotely do. And you would always want to defer to what you can read in the scripture and use that as your acceptable example. So in, in this particular instance he's talking about, or in the instance of a, a, a woman baptizing someone, you would want to find scriptural evidence because, and the reason why I would say do not make exceptions, is because then will somebody will say, well, the best I could do was to find a jug of water, so I poured it over their head and counted that as baptizing. Right? So somebody is going to take that and they're going to run with that. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? And so it's in my, in my reading of the scriptures, we do not take exception or make exception for the laws. We follow them to to the letter of whatever, you know. There are some people who might say, well, maybe we're being legalist or overzealous or whatever, but I think that if you, if you follow it to the letter, then you have nothing to worry about. That's what I would do. And, you know, the, the Lord ultimately has to say so anyway. Because there are those who will find themselves who will be dunked in water and completely submerged and will not have a scriptural baptism. Though they might have found themselves completely underwater, but they don't find themselves in a, for instance, I'm baptized into a denominational church or not for the remission of my sins, or for some other thing, an outward show of my inward glow. That is not a scriptural baptism. Though so you might have found yourself in such a situation. So ultimately, the Lord will determine whether or not your baptism was according to the scripture on the day of judgment when you stand before him. So the best that you and I can do is do it exactly as the scripture says. When it says we go down into the water and we're submersed, as the word baptism suggests, that that is exactly what we do. No more, no less, right? Yeah. By not, well, if you're not down there for 20 seconds or you don't say three Hail Marys while you're, you know what I mean? Like people will add all kinds of extra things on top of it. I'll make this an extra special baptism. The Lord's not looking for an extra special baptism. The baptism by itself is already special. It doesn't need improvement upon. So would you have done so? The practice of baptizing, was that a common thing before John came? That's a good question for you. You've heard of a baptism before that, right? Does anybody know? There's, there are some examples of baptism before that. Ah, uh, somebody, somebody's got one. The baptism of Mo Mo Moses, right? There's, that's referred to, right? So there have been baptisms, but what about this type of baptism? They go down into the water. I mean, this is one of those situations where this was not a, a practice for salvation prior to this point, was it? There had been somebody who had said, go down and dunk yourself. And you guys might remember that fellow. Go down and dunk yourself in the River Jordan seven times. But that's not this. That's not that, is it? So the reason why I asked that question is because that's the reason why you have the question, would you have baptized people? Because this is something that is entirely different and new. It is the commandment of the Lord. It's desire that he does so. Right? We know that it's to fulfill all righteousness when Jesus uh, is baptized. And John says that he, he doesn't even deserve to baptize Jesus. He should be the one getting baptized by Jesus. But this would have been something like, hey, go build that boat because I'm going to flood the earth and I'm going to make it rain. Something like that has never happened before. How can you wrap your mind around that? 
so now when you know to go and pave the way and make the paths of the Lord straight, you've realized your responsibility, and now you're going to do something that's entirely new. Do you think it, that John knew that it probably would not be well met by the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the people who were in charge? Probably not. I mean, we're going to learn later, it definitely was not, in case you're wondering what the answer to that question is. Uh, this new doctrine was not well received. In fact, Jesus is crucified just for that purpose, teaching this new doctrine that he's teaching. So we know it wasn't met well, was it? What about when Stephen preached about it? Was it met well? Well, it didn't end well for him. What about Paul? He received 40 stripes minus one three times. You th what do you think he? What do you think he did? He wasn't. He, we know Paul wasn't stealing or thieving or breaking any laws. He was beaten just for that. And I think there was another occasion when he was beaten, and you know, thrown in jail or something, and told not to preach Jesus anymore. But then they did it anyway. I say that was Paul and so, yeah, Peter and John. So this new doctrine wouldn't have been received well, and it would have been also something that might have been not native to you. Baptism, which now saves us, not the washing of the flesh, but the answer yeah. of a pure conscience Actually, towards God. <laughs> yeah, we might get there. I think it's First Peter three twenty one. I'm gonna say I'm almost positive it is. But so, what do you learn about the scriptures about John's particular baptism that he was performing? Is that like the one that you and I have today? In some ways. are some similarities there, right? So when John does the, and I'll give you the answer here, it's, it's for repentance, right? It's to prepare the people for the way for the next baptism would, which would occur. What we learn about baptism, for instance, in the book of Romans, is that we, when we learn that we're baptized, we come into contact with Jesus' blood, right? We're, likewise, we're buried as his death and we'll be raised up out of the water. We come up out of a new, a new creature. Could the baptism that John was doing have been that baptism? No, because yeah, because this event had not yet taken place. So while there are similarities, there are also some stark differences. Right? So he's attempting to prepare the way or the people for the next baptism, which would be for the remission of sins. And people sometimes say, well, baptism, that doesn't really have a purpose. If I was to ask you, oh, it's in the lesson too. If I was to ask you, What's the purpose of baptism? Without looking at your lesson, could you tell me, and could you tell me the book, chapter, and verse? What's it for? Because it has a purpose, right? Otherwise, why do you do it, right? Does God do anything arbitrarily? That's a good question to ask yourself. Especially not when we're talking about as it relates to salvation, right? There's nothing in there that's just like hokey dokey. So what's it for? And where do you find it? Okay. 
pode ser feito. Entendeu? How about I help you out? And I bet you guys can finish it if I give you this. Men and brethren, what must I do to be saved? Acts 2 and verse 38 is the follow-up to that. And what does he say? Repent and be for what? For the remission of sins. So we understand that baptism has a purpose. So there are those in the denominational world who will tell you that baptism doesn't have a purpose. It's just considered a work. Or it's an outward show of your inward glow. And so you ask people the questions, right? The obvious questions. Um, if I haven't been cleared of, of my sin, right? If my sins have not been remitted, can I go to heaven if I die a sinner? Like my sins have never been remitted. Do I get to go to heaven? Does the Bible say anything about that at all? Okay, so it's a pretty common thing. So you'd say, okay, so can you go to heaven without having your sins remitted? Well, no. Well, what's baptism for? For the remission of sins. Can you think of anything else that's for the remission of your sins in the New Testament? Other than prayer of repentance for those of us who are baptized. We're talking about people who have never, never obeyed the gospel. Well, I can't think of another thing. Well, let me ask you about this. What if you, could you get into heaven if you didn't put on Jesus? Most of them would say, oh, no, 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 no. Well, what does baptism do? Anybody ever read the book of Romans? Does it tell you anything about that? As many of us have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So, we, there is no way that they would agree to those things. But yet they might agree, or they would preach, that baptism is not necessary. So, does baptism have a purpose? Is it a fundamental part of becoming a Christian? Can someone become a Christian without being baptized? Good questions to ask. What do you think? Go ahead. Wayne's got the answer. He says, yes, you can. No, he doesn't. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. Uh, I was going to say, uh, you know, a short sermon, uh, getting uh, saved is Ephesians 1 verse 7 says that it applies to the abolition of sins. Even uh, places in the first verse 7 says that it applies to the abolition of sins. How do you get in there? That's, I mean, isn't that a great? You just got yeah, you got to ask yourself that question. It's like you can do it almost with this, just this simple. It's so. So you ask this very simple question with people. It's a really easy diagram. It's super easy for them to understand. This is inside Christ here. You see that? That's saved and in Christ. The passage is super clear on that, right? So if you haven't been baptized into Christ, where must you be? Well, that means I've got to be outside of Christ, right? Because I can't be baptized into something that I'm, 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 not, I'm already in, right? I, I have to be outside of that thing. It's like, take heed lest you fall, Galatians 5, 4. How can I fall, right, if, if I'm not already there? I have to already be saved. They say, well, that passage doesn't apply to Christians. But how can you fall if you're not already up there, right? So you get simple things like this. If saved is in Christ, and you have to be baptized into that, where then are you? Yeah, is there, is this, so then you'd call this not saved. It's pretty easy, right? But the question I'd have is this. Can you teach this to someone who wanted to know? 
Can you teach this to someone who wanted to know? Could you teach someone, let's say, for instance, we had a fellow walk through the, the doors back there right now. I love hypotheticals. I told you just a little bit ago. So a fellow walks through the door right now, right? Let's say you're the only one in the building. You're not, you're not with the rest of your compadres here. Could you teach them what baptism is and why they need to do it? Could you point to it? Show them where? Because they want to say, just like I would ask you if I was a person who wanted to know, where does it, where, what would you ask me? Where does it say that? So that ought to be the challenge of every Christian. Could you teach it to someone who wanted to know now? Because if you think about ultimately what our responsibility is, it's no different than what John's was. That's why I'm going here, folks. Our responsibility is the same as his. Your, your soul, really, your soul responsibilities are to do just a few things, right? Keep yourself unstained or unspotted from the world, right? And the, and the scriptures tell us, when you teach, also take heed lest you should also fall in to sin. So it's to guard ourselves and to teach others. Right? That's pretty basic when you boil down Christianity. Right? If you wanted to get down, I guess, to the, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. So the question you have to ask yourself is, could I effectively teach hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized if somebody walked through that door right now? I'll let you answer that question for yourself, but if you can't, then that ought to be something as a Christian we work on together. Right? I know somebody who could probably teach you a thing or two about where to start and where to go. There's, there's probably a bunch of us. But I, I do find that it, in general, when you ask a lot of folks, even those who have been Christians for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, many of them can't tell you book, chapter, and verse for the things which we bind. But it would be the same thing I would ask of someone who was teaching in error. If someone were to come through those doors and teach me something contrary to what I have heard, I would say, where did you read that? Show me book, chapter, and verse. So if I would hold them to that standard, I ought to also likewise hold myself to that standard. And I ought to be able to, like John, preach repentance, preach baptism. That's, that's like the onus is on us to be able to do that. And sometimes it's just as easy as a few verses and, uh, you know, a little diagram on a piece of paper. And some people are going to need the whole thing, right? They're, <laughs> they're, they're going to need uh, the historical from start to finish. You know what I mean? Like, if you don't know everything from, you know, Matthew all the way to Revelation and, and frontwards and backwards, they're not going to take your word for it. I understand we're going to run into those people. But for the vast majority of people who are seeking, legitimately seeking to know, can you teach it? And if you can't, you don't have to tell me now. Call me. I'll go through these things with you. Very easy. I've got all these verses listed for each one of those and help you memorize those things and go through them. And knowing and teaching are different. All right, so though you may have it committed to memory, you may not be an effective teacher. But the Bible doesn't give us an out for that. All right? We're still supposed to practice those things. For by now, some of you ought to be teachers. Being a Christian is not a life of comfort. And if not having to teach and not having to participate actively in your salvation or the salvation of others is outside of your comfort, it would get outside of your comfort zone then. I don't know what to tell you. The Lord is going to demand that of us. He demands it of you and he de demands it of me. So we might want to practice those things. But the baptism of John prepared the way for what? The one baptism, the one faith, the one hope, the ones. I mean, anybody here that many ones, you'd almost have to be a fool. You'd have to think me of a fool to think there was two. I mean, I know what the number one is. But yet we have denominations all over the world that are preaching baptism number two, three, four, and on into whatever number you can think of. So our job as Christians ought to be so well-armed 
that we're ready, as Peter tells us, to give a defense for those things in which we have hope. That's where your hope lies, right? Your hope lies in, in your baptism. Because what does is, what is, what the Bible tell us? That if Jesus was never resurrected from the dead, right? Then what? Faith is vain. There's nothing. So if our baptism hinges around him raising from the dead, because that's what our baptism is about, then therein lies your hope. Through him and through obedience to the gospel, we ought to be able to give a defense for that, a reasonable argument. Why is there only one baptism? Some people will ask you that. How come I got to do it that way? Why can't I just, you know, be sprinkled and I'm okay? Or why do I got to do it at all? You know, it, say, it says here, I'm saved by faith only, right? Doesn't that say that? No. It's so <laughs> saved by grace through faith, right? Doesn't say only. But you got a charismatic fella somewhere. Maybe he's standing up behind the pulpit and he's preaching those things and they're eating it up, hook, line, and sinker. And they never open up their Bibles to find out, is that really what the verse says? And I think in reading examples throughout all of the scriptures, we can see how important one word is. Whether it's put in or it's missing, changes the whole context of the of the teaching. Okay, one of the, probably one of the hardest things that I run into is people who have the attitude, not just like what you know, why have I got to do this, why have I got to do this. Specifically, the way they frame it is, well, why do I need to be baptized again? Yeah. Right, because in their minds, it's already been done. You know, their parents took care of it for them when they were infants, and you know, they were sprinkled. You know, they've been Christian since they were eight days old. And yeah. uh, I don't know, you know, why you're bothering me. You know, oh yeah, I've heard it. So the question I have, right, and I love, you know, that's one of the things I always love doing. You know, like I told you, I studied with that fellow who wrote this book. And did I, you remember what I told you on the Lord's Supper? All right, y'all failed in it if you don't remember that. No, just kidding. Remember when I told you he likes to split hairs about words? And when he talked about spilled and, instead of shed, you understand what I'm saying? And we talk about things like the Gospels. Why are you putting an S after that? How many Gospels are in the New Testament? Why are we talking about the Gospels? There's the Gospel according to. There's only one Gospel. Right? What about the book of Revelations? How many Revelations did he get, folks? Okay, book of Revelation. Alright, so you quoted that passage there about being rebaptized. Did he use the word rebaptized? Because a person can't be rebaptized. And a person can't be baptized again. You were either baptized the first time right, or you weren't. So this is now either your first time or you don't need to do it again. Yeah. You can't be baptized again. You can't be re-baptized. You can be baptized into this new thing, which was the thing that they were not baptized into in the first place. Which is why I think it's in the Acts chapter 19. It's the Ephesians, yeah. right? But they were still baptized when John Right. Just the wrong but they were baptized into something else. Right? But people today talk about... Well, they were baptized into the baptism of Christ the second time, right? So they weren't ever... They were baptized into something new. But people today, they want to talk about, well, you know, I was baptized before I was sprinkled, and now you want me to be rebaptized. No, you wasn't baptized the first time. We're not talking about rebaptizing you. So we, have, we ought to be able to explain that. That's what I'm talking about sometimes with teaching. We all understand that concept when I say it out loud, right? It makes sense. But can we teach that? That's what we're asking here with this question with John. Would you have done so? Right? And, and although, John, you, know, and you might say, well, 
you know, they had the gift of the Holy Spirit and they were being guided and so they didn't have to remember all these things. And, okay. Well, they also didn't have it written down in, in their phones and in their iPads and in their everywhere else and just have ready access to it 24-7. We can, we can learn those things. Rebaptized. I've heard that used before. That sometimes words are important. Right? I hate that phrase, something matters. I hate ever since whatever everything seems to matter, everybody tells you all the time. This matters, that matters, 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 matters. But when it comes to the matter of salvation or the matters of salvation, words matter. Yeah. Well, I said read that, but yeah. I think I know everybody yeah. here knew what I'm hearing. Yeah. Okay? I wasn't wrong when I said that. Okay? I wasn't wrong. So no. don't get on my case. Nobody's getting on your case. You are. No, I'm not. I'm talking about the doctrine of the world that they teach. Yeah, well, I take that that you, you know, I'm saying something wrong because I use the word. So if I'm wrong, I'm using the word, then you know, I've got to change the word because I was wrong. And I don't think I was wrong. He wasn't saying that you were promoting the world they asked you about. No. Not, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. He's discouraging us to be careful in the way we yes. express things because other people. Like I could be baptized again. So this is what I would say to that. No, they can't be. Because they can't be rebaptized. Here's the reason why. Can they be baptized into John's baptism now? No. So the only baptism that they were talking about is the baptism of Christ now. You and me and whoever you and I will teach. No, no. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Hold on. The word baptism means going down on a little water. That's what it means. Immersion, yes. Immersion. Now, if they were immersed in one religion, they were immersed. They were baptized in the Greek, in the Greek word. The Greek word for baptism would apply here. So, so I would be careful using that because when we're talking about a when we're talking about a religious aspect, we're not talking about just getting dumped. Okay. Uh, but as I said before, and whether you think you're wrong or you're not, it's not a matter of us arguing between who's right or who's wrong. A person cannot be rebaptized. The they were yes, in the true sense of the scriptural baptism. Yeah. It cannot be done. It is not an example of anything we see in the scriptures. You were either baptized according to the New Testament rules of being baptized, or you were not. That is just the cut and the dry of it. Okay. A person either confesses according to the way the scriptures say you confess, or you didn't. Right? We understand that these, there are some things, right? And they say, well, that's a gray area. There are no gray areas in the Bible. Not a one. That's the beauty of the scriptures. That's the beauty of God's wisdom, right? Sometimes as people, when we explain things, or I hold this person accountable, or I do that thing, there might be gray areas with my judgment, right? Because I look in the context of things or whatever, and, and, and that's the human nature of the way that we deal with things. With God, when it comes to salvation, there is no gray area in anything. Go first. Of the filth of the flesh. But in answer, 
you had this going on in John's day. And they were calling it baptism. And it wasn't. It was just a bath. That's what makes John different. It's a one-time thing. It's a one-time thing. Now, if you've been immersed, it really depends on what you were taught to determine how you get in the determine how you were baptized. If you can't be taught wrong in that that life. You gotta be taught according to the scriptures and, 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 and be baptized according to the scriptures. One time thing. All this other stuff, people are all your baptism. But it's not. If it wasn't according to the scriptures, it wasn't. There was a critical there to go to the flesh. You just dunked in water? It was just a wash. Yep. Just got them wet? That's that basically is the background of uh, John's baptism and that, that verse from first Peter. Peter had to address that. It's not a bad. And that's what these Jewish sects are doing. So that pure baptism is a sin. And that's even how some so called Christians today treat baptism. Like it's just a it's just a thing you do, right? It doesn't have any actual meaning. You're just getting wet. I've had a number of people who claim to be Christians in my life who have told me that. But it, you're just getting wet. With the water, don't do nothing. Yeah. You have to be careful of your terminology. Because people will run with it and run straight out the door with a with, with the wrong understanding. You know, there was this there was this universal church thing going around. And they were called the church of Christ, the universal church. So the Bible says you get to the You got to ask the question, who has gone on in terms of are they still with the new church? Even though they're going on. Yes! Yes! There's a church on the earth. Even there's a church in eternity. There are different kingdoms. Right? And each one of those things, that's why it's so important that we understand specifically what we're talking about. You have to, you have to take close attention to the terminology. There's three heavens. You gotta know. What are you talking about? Specifically, what are we talking about? And we have to know those things because people have taken just those subtle differences and they've ran and taught completely new doctrines. And that is how you have splits of the church. Yep. Now where do you think all these denominations come from? One little thing that went off and it formed its own and then, then from there two more things came off and then this one split and went that way. You know, that's how that kind of stuff starts. If you don't pay careful and close attention to exactly what is said. It's so important that we are careful with that's why. Why why are you guys always when you say those things, you well, it's not a work of the church. Be careful to say that because I don't want to give off the wrong impression. Because now somebody's gonna take that and run with it and say, Well, now you guys look at you guys are doing common meals and doing all those things, aren't you? She got to you before that. This is why he says it's an answer of a clear conscience towards God. I have done everything and all things 
in the way that you have prescribed. So if you look back at that time when you were nine and you say, man, I don't know. Now you've violated your own conscience in saying that what I did at that time, I think it wasn't good enough. And you can make that decision for yourself. You can say, yes, it was, or no, it wasn't. And if you determine that no, it wasn't, then you no longer have a clear conscience towards God, which means you need to be baptized, right? Because you wasn't baptized the first time. Because you don't have a clean conscience. You didn't do everything the way it was supposed to be done. You wasn't baptized. But if you did, then there you go. And that's a question. That's something that you need. Can you point to the Scriptures? Can you do it exactly as the Scriptures say? And did you understand? Nobody knows that but you. I don't, I don't know what the condition of your heart is when you got baptized. Did you understand what for? What were you being baptized into? What does it represent? What are you now putting on? What are you committing to do every day, this day, and going forward? If you understood all of those things, hey, look, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Let's go. Let's go do it. There's not an age on that. There's a mindset. There's an understanding. There's a position of the heart. All of those things are qualifiers. But whether you're, you're old enough to get your permit, or I mean, that has never had anything to do with it. I, one of my, my young cousins, he said, well, uh, I want to be able to call myself a teenager before I get baptized. But what does that have to do with anything? Or I want to wait until my 12th birthday because I want it to be really special. It doesn't make it any more special, bud. Okay. It's when you have an answer of a clean conscience towards God and you can do it as the scripture has prescribed, then you are baptized. And if you have done that, then you have no need to ever do it again. That's it. It's all been fulfilled. You have an answer to do a whole bunch of other stuff now. No doubt about that. Believe me. Last comment. You get the last one in before we call it a go. We've got to close these books. That's too big a word for me, buddy. Do oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, that's too big a word for me. You're going to break yeah. it. It doesn't have an effect. That yeah, private school. Okay. I know you're just getting wet, it's getting water, it's a sign, whatever. But one more element to that that we need to add that the scriptures talk about is the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? Peter associates it with baptism in Acts 2 38. Paul, whenever he's talking to those men who have been baptized in the John baptism in Acts 19, you know, how did he tell? Like, the, the question that he asked was, did you receive the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, we don't even know there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> and that, like, that was There the it is. There's that the telltale the sign. And that's Red what flag. Paul knew, I've got to baptize these guys. Yep. They need to be baptized yeah. into the And a lot of the, the of Christ. world says, yeah, I've got the gift of the Holy Spirit, having never been baptized. If it's not important to be baptized, then ask the question to yourself. Why did Philip stop the chariot? Yeah. What was the point? It seems silly, right? Why even bother? So, a good, a rousing study. We got through number three. Where you guys, in case you guys didn't notice, we're, uh, do, we're fulfilling a pattern here. We're at a breakneck pace. Uh, but we're doing well with the study, and I'm glad everybody's getting something out of it. So, thanks for your time. Thanks for your study.